Chapter 54 Bridal Shower There's something I'd like you to know, Valerie. Cynthia says as we walk down the corridors of the Windsworths, Tropical Island Mansion, on our way to my suite. I brace myself, ready for a threat, or warning, or something of the like. I'm going to let you in on a little secret, just between the two of us. I always hoped it would be you, she says, beaming with genuine happiness as she looks over to me and smiles. Well, that's the last thing I expected to hear coming out of her vile mouth. I force a weak smile in response, although my insides are seething like a knot of snakes in her detestable presence. That's right, she says, leading me through the corridors. You were always my favorite to win. I was rooting for you all along, Valerie, because I always knew that you'd be absolutely perfect for my Oliver being in a position, like mine the first lady at the helm of a great business empire. Well, it's tough it takes a survivor, someone of considerable determination and strength. I see that strength in you, Valerie. In fact, I see a lot of myself in you, which is why I'll be thrilled to have you as my daughter-in-law and I see nothing of myself in you, I think to myself, but I just smile to cover up my absolute disgust. Franklin's also over the moon, of course. Cynthia continues. Honestly, he was initially rooting for your rival Svetlana for a while during the earlier stages of the wedding games tournament, but you won his heart with your resilience and fighting spirit, just as you won our free-spirited sons, Genuine love congratulations, my darling girl. You've truly outshone all the rest and proven yourself to be a true star. I know you will continue to shine bright and brilliant as my successor at the pinnacle of our great organization. We finally reach my suite, and Cynthia unlocks it using the fingerprint touchpad. Finally. I can't wait for this painfully awkward heart-to-heart -to, -heart to be over. This is where we part ways, my lovely. She says at me, taking my hands in hers. Now, you go get changed into the outfit laid out for you in your dressing room. The groomsmen will escort you thereafter to the bridesmaids, chalet for a brief bridal shower, and then you'll be brought back here for some shut-eye tomorrow's the big day, so you'll need to be well rested. This will be the last time you sleep alone as a single woman. You're in the frangipani suite this evening, but from tomorrow, you and Oliver will be together in the honeymoon suite as a married couple. Now, a you revoir, my dear. Enjoy your bachelorette party. She reaches forward and gives me a quick parting hug, whispering the words I'm so glad it was you, my valiant Valerie in my ear, before she leaves, hurrying off along the corridor back the way we came. The groomman waits outside the door, while I go into my suite to get changed. Just as Cynthia said there would be, a bridal shower appropriate outfit has been laid out for me in the dressing room, comprised of a silky white satin knee length nightgown and a matching belted night robe with the word bride embroidered onto the back in elegant silver thread. There's also a pair of fluffy white slippers, which I gratefully slip my aching feet into, sore after an entire day spent on my feet dancing, and then walking around the grand ballroom during tonight's charm and persuasion-themed game. Let's go! The groomsman impatiently calls out from the doorway. We're running behind schedule. And so I hurry out of the suite into the corridor. He shoves me forward, through the mansion's winding corridors and down a long flight of steps, until we reach an inconspicuous back door that leads outside. The night air is warm and humid, sweetly scented with the fragrance of flaming pink torch ginger lilies and canary yellow elong elong, which line the long cobbled path leading away from the house into the jungle. I half expect the guy to load me onto the back of a golf cart, which is what the groomsmen usually do when we're heading somewhere other than the main house, but to my surprise, he just jostles me forward down the path. There are lit tiki torches at various intervals down the path to see by, casting the surrounding jungle in a bright golden glow. Come on, it's not far now. 
the groomsman says, just as a rustic wooden bungalow-style villa, with a gabled palm-leaf roof, comes into view. One entire side of the villa is covered in a thick carpet of flowering bougainvillea creeper, its bright magenta blossoms resembling a lovely blanket of pink and green draped over the structure. It all looks so lovely, so simple and so natural, a far cry from the luxurious and elegantly disguised high-security, high-tech prison I just came from. As we draw nearer, I see that the rustic simplicity of this place is just an illusion. It's as secure as the rest of the buildings on this accursed island, with fingerprint scanner touchpads and thick bulletproof glass windows. The groomsman scans his fingerprint to unlock the door, then ushers me inside while he stands guard on the villa's veranda. They're waiting for you upstairs, he says gruffly. You have one hour then I'm escorting you back to your suite. He closes the door behind me, leaving me alone in the villa's candlelit entrance hall. From upstairs, I can hear faint, muffled voices the voices of the disqualified girls. So I guess Cynthia really wasn't lying about keeping them alive to serve as bridesmaids during the wedding. Although, that doesn't guarantee that they'll be kept alive after we tie the knot once they're no longer of any use. I practically run up the flight of stairs, reaching the villa's second level in a matter of seconds and almost losing a slipper in the process. Even though I barely know these girls, I've spent the last few days convinced that they were probably lying dead and buried out in the jungle. So this feels like a small, wonderful miracle, and I can't wait to see their faces to know for sure that they are really and truly alive. The voices are coming from a brightly lit room at the end of the dark corridor, a shining rectangle of warm golden light, so I run towards it and to my surprise, I hear my name spoken out loud. I have to know what they're saying about me. In that split second, my reflexes take over and my body moves of its own accord. I go automatically into stealth mode, as though I'm lurking around in the virtual shadows in my favorite morph on a Friday night, surrounded by danger at every turn. In the shadows, I press up against the corridor's wall, just a few feet away from the doorway, hidden from sight, and eavesdrop on the eliminated girl's conversation. But first, I make sure the audio input on my promise ring is blocked by balling up my left hand into a tight fist and holding it against my chest, then covering it with my right hand. I need to be sure that I'm the only one eavesdropping on this little chat. You really think we can trust her? A preppy Californian-accented voice asks. That sounds a bit like Holly the bubbly and friendly, but slightly airheaded girl who was eliminated first during the ring selection challenge. Of course we can. A girl with a familiar Vermont accent replies, Kim, I think. Valerie's not a Winsworth yet, but she will be shortly. I hear a girl with a Russian accent, undoubtedly Svetlana interject. And that's exactly why we've got to be careful. Think about it. Svetlana continues. Now that she's won, Valerie has more to lose than any of us here. I say we can't trust her. You're just bitter because she beat you in the bedroom challenge. A girl who I immediately recognize as she may says, her tone cool and even. Don't let your resentment cloud your judgment, Svetlana. She's right. We're all on the same side. A new voice pipes up. That must be Mara even though it's been less than a week since she was eliminated in the makeover challenge. It feels like a lifetime ago, and I only vaguely remember what her voice sounds like. That's right, Shu Mei says firmly. When Svetlana, Andrea, and I were in the spa hot tub with her, Valerie said that she and Oliver were working on an escape plan. She might be our best hope. Our only hope? Well, I don't remember her saying that, Svetlana says stubbornly. Mara is saying something but her soft-spoken voice is slightly muffled. I need to get closer. So with my back pushed up against the corridor wall in the shadows, 
I slide a few inches towards the room where the eliminated girls' voices are coming from. Crash. To my left, something falls off the wall, a hanging picture, I'm guessing, and shatters on the floor at my feet. The girls inside the room hear the commotion and immediately go quiet. I hear whispers of, Is it one of them? The groomsmen. And then someone Svetlana, I think, call out hello. Who's there? Todd, is that you? You sick perverted fuckwit. You better not be Jay. It's just me. I cut her off mid-sentence, forcing a smile as I reveal myself, stepping into the light and walking in through the doorway. The five disqualified girls are sitting around on a huge super king-sized four-poster bed, each wearing matching pale pink satin night robes and gowns, like mine but were mine, is embroidered with the word. Bride in silver thread on the back, each of theirs, says bridesmaid apart from Svetlana's, which says maid of honor. Finally, Svetlana says sarcastically, How nice of you to finally join us, Valerie. Now, let's talk business. Talk bu Before we begin, Svetlana says, then indicates with a nod of her head that I should look down at her hands. She and all the other girls have their left hands pressed down into the bed's duvet, their right hands tightly clamped over to block the promise ring's audio inputs. My hands, on the other hand, are no longer clenched together to cover my ring. I forgot about that the moment I accidentally dislodged that hanging picture and gave away that I was eavesdropping on them. But before I can cover up my promise ring, I'm startled by a strange whirling and squeaking sound from somewhere in the room, like two polished pieces of wood or metal sliding over one another. We all look up at the same spot in alarm. On the far wall, opposite the huge four-poster bed, a square panel in the wall at eye level seems to be moving. The small wooden door is roughly two feet across, smoothly sliding open to reveal a dark alcove within. The high-pitched whirring sound is louder now and a cold shiver of fear trickles down my spine as I recognize the source. It sounds like a drone, hopefully not an armed one. As I think this, a shiny black drone drifts out of the shadowy alcove like a giant metal mosquito, no larger than a football. It floats through the air above us for a few seconds before settling down on a tall wooden cabinet several feet away from the bed. A tiny red dot of light burns, like a hellish, fiery eye at the drone center, letting us know that we are being watched and probably listened to as well. All of us captive girls look from one to the other, sharing a look of trepidation and an unspoken question, the thing we are all wondering and trying desperately to work out right now. How much did they hear? Were Cynthia and her cohorts able to hear the eliminated girls' entire conversation when that drone was tucked away in its alcove, and if so, did they catch the bit about Oliver hatching an escape plan? Good evening, ladies. Cynthia's voice abruptly echoes out from a speaker somewhere on the drone, giving her words a hollow, tinny quality. How lovely to have you all reunited again like this. Now, as tradition dictates, it is inappropriate for the mother of the groom to attend her future daughter-in-law's bachelorette party, which is why I am here only in spirit, to keep an eye on you rowdy girls, and to ensure no silly business happens. I know from my own youth how wild these hen's nights can get now. You will have noticed that the drone has parked itself atop of a mahogany cabinet. The cabinet is now unlocking remotely. There is a metallic clicking sound, and then a sliding whoosh from deep within the cabinet, as she says this. Within the cabinet, on the left side, you will find a mini-fridge stocked with Paul Roger and Vuve Clicquot Champagne, Chardonnay, fruit spritzers, and a selection of sweet treats for you ladies to enjoy. A word to the wise, though don't overdo wit. I'm sure you all want to look lovely in your dresses tomorrow, and having a bloated or hungover appearance won't do especially for the bride. On the right side of the cabinet, 
you'll find a variety of wedding-themed board games, plus a list of other ideas for suitable activities. I urge you a fun tonight, girls. Let's make this a bridal shower to remember. No one says anything, and for a moment we are just staring mutely at the ominous black drone perched atop the cabinet. Oh, come on now, ladies. Cynthia's voice emanates from the drone. This is a party, not a funeral. Honestly, what a sullen lot you are nothing a little bit of bubbly can't fix, though. Svetlana, as the maid of honor, it's your duty to get this party started on your feet, girl. Pour the others some champagne. Svetlana does as she's told, slowly standing up and then hesitantly, making her way over to the wooden cabinet, her wary gaze, never leaving the drone perched atop it. As promised, there is a mini fridge and a selection of board games within the cabinet. Svetlana takes out seven champagne flutes, placing them on a tall glass side table, before uncorking the bottle of Paul Roger and pouring us each a glass. Then she brings us each our champagne one at a time. Valerie, go over and select your first game. Cynthia instructs. The right side of the cabinet is stacked with board games, mostly with a wedding theme there's Pictionary, Wedding Edition, Love Letter Wedding Edition, and more. There's also a printed-out list of game ideas. I skim through it, trying to figure out if there are any that the other girls and I could play as a ruse to secretly communicate with each other without Cynthia realizing. I see two promising options with instructions printed as follows. One wedding word scramble. Participants are to list off scrambled words associated with the wedding, the couple, and the bride. Whichever player can entangle the most words the fastest wins the game. Two charades, wedding movies edition. Players are to write the names of wedding-themed movies on cards and divide the party into two or more teams. The players then act out the titles to their own team members, who must guess the answer in two minutes or less. Here are some movies to get you started. The Wedding Singer, 27 Dresses, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, Mamma Mia, Wedding Crashers. Hum, neither of those games could potentially work. If we play Wedding Word Scramble, I could write out a quick coded message for the other girls, telling them that the escape plan is still on and to be ready to attack our captors and flee the island after the vows. I don't need to get too specific, because it's not like I have any specific information to tell them anyway, nothing concrete or tangible really. Hopefully Oliver's managed to firm up the plan and will have more info for me before we walk down the aisle together tomorrow otherwise, I'm going to have to wing it. Charades might also work, but it would be harder to hide my meaning from the watching eyes of Cynthia as she surveys us through the drone. Truth or dare? Svetlana suddenly says, hooking my gaze with her bright blue eyes. There's a hint of a challenge there, I think. Maybe she's onto something, actually. It's a good way for us to ask each other veiled questions under the guise of playing a game. Okay. I say, settling down on the side of the bed as I take a deep sip of champagne. I guess I'll go first, Mara Truth, or Dare. Everyone seems surprised by my choice singling out the quiet, reserved, timid brunette. Well, um, Truth, she says warily. Okay, there's something I've been wondering. I say, feeling stupid for asking but still curious nonetheless. The morning after your date with Oliver, you were upset, really upset. Then it seemed like you intentionally sabotaged yourself during the makeover challenge, as if you wanted to lose and get disqualified. Why? Mara looks down at her lap, probably thinking over how to answer. I feel bad asking her this. Before I knew Oliver, I'd wondered, if perhaps her desperation to get eliminated was something to do with him, but now I'm certain it must be something else. Perhaps Mara knows, or suspects, 
Something about that angers of winning this sick, twisted game. If I'm in even worse trouble than I already think I am, I want to know now. Well, it's because, because. He hesitates before continuing to speak. I'm already engaged. I didn't mention that when I applied for the user acceptance testing lead job at WIC, because they were asking all these weird personal questions during the interview about my love life and what sort of person I was, and I didn't think they'd accept me. If they knew I really needed the job, and my fiancé is a woman, and that's why you were determined not to marry Oliver under any circumstances. I murmur, realizing that her utter distress and despair after winning the first challenge all makes sense now. Mara just nods, smiling sadly. The worst part is that Lindy, my fiancé, well, she probably doesn't even know anything's wrong. Mara says, her eyes brimming with tears. As far as she knows, I'm still on a week-long training boot camp out in the middle of nowhere, far from civilization and cell phone reception. I sometimes wonder if I'll ever get to see her again, before they they. Her lip is quivering, and I can see she's about to burst into tears. So I just place my hand over hers, squeezing it. We're making it out of here. We all are. I say, not really caring if the drone overhears these words. Kim leans over and gives Mara a quick comforting hug, followed by Shu Mei. We have to stay positive. Shu Mei says, attempting a smile as Mara wipes away tears. That's enough wallowing in self-pity. Svetlana says bluntly. It's Mara's turn now but she's obviously too upset to take it so. Valerie Truth Audair. Truth. I answer, already knowing this is the reply she and the others were expecting. Did you and Oliver know each other from before the competition? Svetlana asks, taking me off guard. Now that I was definitely not expecting. W what? Why? I stammer, confused by the strange question. Maybe I misunderstood her, perhaps. She really doesn't have a hidden agenda in choosing this game, and any hints I drop about the escape plan will be falling on deaf ears, oblivious to the hidden subtext. It doesn't matter why I'm asking. She says impatiently. You chose truth, so you have to answer. Truthfully, obviously. So, did you and Oliver know each other from before? Had the two of you ever met before you came to this island? Because it sure seems like you have. No one speaks for a while, and then I decide it's easier to just tell the truth. I need to gain these girls. Trust and lying straight to their faces isn't going to help my cause. Yes, we've met before. I say, prompting the other girls to gasp in surprise. Although, I didn't know who he was at the time. And we only met briefly, for like, fifteen minutes or something, when we were trapped together in the elevator at my old workplace. I stop myself just in time, before those final three words can slip out and damn us all. Oliver told me that he was covertly visiting my old employer on that day in order to start secret discussions around selling his parents' company to them once he took over as CEO. If the Winsworths find out about that, who knows what'll happen. So the game's been fixed this entire time. Svetlana says, her voice dangerously low now. No wonder you got all the way to first place. You had an unfair advantage from the start. I bet you actually chose to come here. The rest of us were abducted and forced to play along, but you. You're wrong, Svetlana. I say trying to keep my voice calm and steady. I'm just as much of an unwilling participant in all this as you are we're on the same side. I'm seated with my back to the drone and its ever-watchful camera, so I take a risk here as I say the word. Sighed. I blink rapidly at Svetlana, then at the other girls. I really wish I knew Morse code right now, but this is the best I can do. Please just hear me out. I say slowly, the attention of the six other girls, 
now firmly fixed on me. There's no need to attack me. I blink my eyes rapidly as I say the word. Attack, hoping that they'll notice the emphasis. After all, the whole point of this game is that we all vow to tell the truth. I'm not trying to leave anything out. The full truth is I barely knew Oliver before I came to the island. Okay. Do you understand? Attack after vows. Leave island. Please, 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 let them join the dots. Let them get it. One by one, each girl works out the hidden message, nodding in acknowledgement. Except for Svetlana, who is so infuriated that Shiz completely missed what I'm trying to say. Bullshit, she says through gritted teeth, balling her hands up into fists. You've been laughing at us this whole time, you and Oliver, working together and... Oh, no. Stop speaking. I lunge forward at Svetlana across the bed, hoping to clamp my hand over her mouth before anything more slips out. Unfortunately, she misunderstands and thinks I'm about to attack her. Her eyes flash with raw aggression, and she grabs my wrist as I draw near. She slams me down hard on the bed, and she's about to sucker punch me at close range before the other girls pry her off me, pushing her off the side of the bed as she screeches the words, Slit. And. Whore. At the top of lungs. The drone is hovering in the air a few feet above us, and Cynthia's tinny voice rings out into the suddenly silent room. Ladies, is there a problem? She asks, the camera recording our every move as the drone circles the bed. Should I send in the groomsmen? No. I say a little too quickly. There's no problem. Everything's under control. Um, she may, truth or dare. The drone hovers over us for a few moments more before heading back to the cabinet and alighting upon its previous vantage point. If you say so, Valerie, Cynthia says, clearly not entirely convinced. Just don't play too rough with her. Girls, our bride needs to be fresh as a daisy for her big day tomorrow. Resume the bachelorette party. And so, like good little lap dogs, we continue pretending to play along with Cynthia's demented, depraved game. By the time that the so-called bachelorette party is finally over, I'm well and truly ready to pass out and sleep with the groomsmen, calling out time's up. Let's get moving. From the stairwell, I quickly hug each of the girls goodbye even Svetlana, despite my strong suspicions that she literally hates me, and then make my way downstairs. To my surprise, the groomsmen waiting there to escort me back to my suite, in the mansion, isn't the same guy who brought me here earlier. It's Stephen Oliver's man on the inside. Or well, at least, I think he's Oliver's man on the inside. Oliver's never really confirmed that, so I can't be certain that this guy really is an ally. Let's go, Valerie, he says, holding the villa's front door open for me. I walk out ahead of him, and then he locks the door behind him, before falling into step beside me. Maybe there's some way... I could indirectly ask him if he's working with Oliver without making my question obvious in case he isn't. Think, Val, think. But the moment we are a few feet down the jungle path between the bridesmaids, Chalet, and the main house, Stephen makes the first move and saves me from having to fish for answers. Without missing a step or slowing down his stride, he nudges me gently in the side with his elbow then holds his left hand up in a fist, covering it with his right hand. He wants me to block my promise ring. I do as he says, and he looks behind us, perhaps checking that we aren't being followed by Cynthia's drone. We need to keep moving, but we can slow down slightly to buy us more time. He says without turning to face me, ever so slightly slowing his pace. There are cameras on the front exterior walls of the bridesmaids, chalet, and there'll be someone in the control room, watching you move on screen, or rather, watching a little red dot 
that represents the tracking device in your ring, that is. They'll notice if we stop or veer off the path. You're working with Oliver? I say, even though I already know the answer. Yes, he says. Oliver regrets that he can't be here himself, but I'm passing on a message from him. At this very moment, he's still in the grand study with his father, who is signing over sole ownership of the Winsworth Interactive Company to his son. Oliver's being watched very closely right now, so it's unlikely that you'll see him again before the wedding tomorrow. He wanted you to know that the plan is changing. Changing. I repeat his words stupidly. How? Why? He's not getting cold feet about escaping, is he? No, nothing like that. Stephen says. We've just realized that we were overly optimistic about the logistics of getting a weapon to Oliver before the wedding ceremony. I was aiming to bring him something simple but deadly and easy to conceal like a handgun or a hunting knife, but there have been complications. There's still hope, though we've thought of something else, something even better than those original options. But I'll need your help to get it. I'll do whatever I can. I say, good, Stephen says. I need to know where I can find Dr. Rambrin's finger, the one you chopped off. I'm so taken aback by the unexpected question that I almost stop walking, feeling an instant rush of hot bile in the back of my throat at the memory of what I had to do during my escape attempt. But Stephen steadies me, keeping me moving as he speaks. The doctor's dead, by the way. Stephen says, without any hint of expression on his face. Don't feel bad about it, though. It was Cynthia Winsworth who killed him after the other groomsmen found him paralyzed on his sick bay floor and deemed him to be of no further use. They noticed the missing finger, obviously, but as far as I know, no one's found it. Or bothered to look for it, I need that finger, Valerie. What are you going to do with it? I ask my skin prickling over with goosebumps. The late doctor had a cabinet in his sick bay office, accessible only via a fingerprint touchpad program to recognize his print and his alone. Stephen explains, inside that cabinet, according to one of the spa assistants, with a loose tongue, who would occasionally help doctor. Rumsern out, there are three syringes of a deadly neurotoxin. It's the same toxin that the promise rings are able to inject into their wearers' veins as a last resort punishment. You're going to use those syringes as your weapon. I murmur, considering the practicalities of the idea. Our weapon. He corrects me. We'll each have a syringe one for you. One for me, one for Oliver. I'll aim to get yours to you sometime tomorrow morning, after you have recited your vows. Oliver's going to turn around and hold that sharp little needle right up against his father's neck, threatening to pump him full of neurotoxin. If he doesn't obey, I'll do the same for Todd, and you'll handle your brand new mother-in-law. We're disabling all the remote holders. Basically, we'll take their remotes, then free you and Oliver and the bridesmaids from the promise rings. And from there, we walk out of the chapel, with the Windsworths held hostage, and we make our escape. I get paid. You get your freedom and a one-way ticket out of Dodge. But none of that is possible unless I can find Dr. Rameron's severed finger to get into that locked cabinet. The mansion is coming into view at the end of the torchlit path, looming in the starlight, like a great crouching white monster above the jungle clearing. I dropped it as soon as I stepped foot outside the mansion. I say, trying to figure out how best to describe the spot. I escaped through a random back door. There was a hallway with a low bench, beach towels, swimming costumes. The mudroom good. Stephen says. I dropped the finger just outside the door in the bushes. I say, but it's been two days. Surely some sort of jungle creatures sniffed it out by now, and taken it away. I shudder at the thought of a curious omnivorous monkey, 
finding the finger and snacking on it, or something worse a raptor, or a jungle cat. Let's hope that's not the case, Stephen says as we draw up closer to the front of the mansion. We should stop talking now. There are security cameras all over this place, and I don't know which ones are mixed up. Okay, but one last thing, there's something I need you to do for me when you're in the doctor's office. I say in a low whisper, and then I proceed to make my audacious request, taking a gamble on the flinciest ghost of a chance hours later. I am awoken from a dreamless sleep in the shadowy silence of my suite. The time 2.34 and blinks across my vision, a line of shimmering white digital numbers against the dark ceiling. Good. He did it, I think to myself drowsily. Before I fall back to sleep, I see a single line of text flash across my retinas, then disappear. It reads, Primary user Valerie Sybil Green, enabled and logged on. Welcome back, Valerie. The next morning is a blur of activity, a surreal whirlwind, which rages like a stormy ocean all around me. I have to pinch myself a few times throughout the morning, hardly able to believe that this is the big day. This is it. Today is my wedding day, a day most women dream about since they were little girls. But how many of those little girls imagine that their special day will take place on a mysterious tropical island, under threat of certain death, surrounded by strangers and enemies? There's a final dress, fitting at the crack of dawn, followed by hours of hair and makeup. The sun is high in the midday sky by the time I'm standing, before a full-length mirror in my suite's dressing room, admiring the handiwork of a half a dozen makeup artists, manicurists, hairdressers, and a stylist. My hair has been expertly styled into a side-swept French chignon, with several loose tendrils, fanning out around my face for a soft and romantic effect. My makeup was done by the same makeup artists who transformed me during the makeover challenge, and they've stuck closely to my winning look from that day after all, as they say, if it ain't broke, why fix it? The soft rosy matte makeup palette is beautifully ethereal and reminds me of springtime, contrasting with subtle black eyeliner and long dark lashes. A charming rosy lip and sheer cherry blossom, pink blush cheek finish off the natural, barely their look. Most stunning of all is the wedding dress and veil. Although it's been less than a week, since I last saw the garments I selected, I'd forgotten just how breathtakingly stunning they are. Now, I stand admiring myself in the mirror, dressed in the magnificent Oscar de la Renta dress, crafted from silk taffeta, tulle, and delicate antique Brussels, rose point lace with long lace sleeves, and a high neckline, and a fitted bodice tapering down to a graceful billowing bell-shaped skirt. The veil is a breezy floral embellished ivory lace masterpiece that trails down almost all the way to the floor, delicate as a puff of cloud floating in the air. The finishing touch before I'm truly ready to walk down the aisle is to put on the pair of white leather, Christian Louboutin stilettos with blue lacquered soles, which I selected earlier in the competition. They are stacked side by side in front of the mirror, ready for me to step into them. Looking down at them, I notice that there's a brightly gleaming copper penny lying at the bottom of the left shoe. It was probably placed there for good luck by Ruby, the dressing room attendant. I never did find out what happened to her after I tried to attack the groomsman in the accessories room, and I can only hope that she's okay as I slip my feet into the shoes, wondering at their enchanting beauty and luxurious craftsmanship and wondering for the briefest moment how much they cost, a line of shimmering white text pops up on my retinal overlays, informing me that the shoes are a limited edition custom-designed pair, retailing for an eye-watering $1.6 million. Irritated, I dismiss the useless information, causing it to immediately disappear. I really wish it was somehow possible to keep the overlays switched off, 
until I need them later during the wedding ceremony. I've gotten better at controlling the flow of data at least now that I've realized how to better control the lenses, artificial intelligence component. I see now that I'm only shown information that I've mentally requested and even a passing thought or musing can trigger an answer. So in order to not get overwhelmed by random meaningless facts and scraps of information popping up into my line of sight every few seconds, I need to maintain perfect clarity of the mind, staying sharp and focused to a T. I need to ignore all distractions and stay focused. Easy as pie not. An hour later, I'm standing outside the large wooden front doors of the Winsworth's private chapel, surrounded by lush green jungle on all sides. I'm gripping my bridal bouquet so tightly in my hands that it's a wonder the tightly bound bundle of ribbon-wrapped stems hasn't snapped in two I'm that nervous. The processional has presumably already gone down the aisle, although I didn't get to see any of them, because I was still on my way to the chapel, with my escort at that point. Given the importance of the day and my role in it, I expected my escort to be that vile scumbag who heads up the groomsman, a.k.a. the best man, a.k.a. Todd. Thank God it wasn't, though. Failing Todd, I expected it would be Oliver's man on the inside Stephen, who I'd hoped would soon give me the syringe of neurotoxin as outlined in the escape plan, he relayed to me last night. But to my surprise, I was escorted to Thevenu by one of the other random groomsmen, a silent, hulking lump of a man. So now I'm fidgeting nervously outside the chapel, aware that at any moment it'll be my cue to walk down the aisle, without the promised weaponized syringe. This isn't how it was supposed to be. Something's gone wrong, I just know it. Sorry I'm late, last-minute alterations to the tux. My father's voice breaks me out of my thoughts. Wow, pumpkin, you look so beautiful. Don't call me that, I say, cringing at the old childhood nickname. Ready to do this? He asks, and I nod, feeling somewhat revolted at the thought of this man, the dictionary definition of absent father and unreliable walking me down the aisle, and giving me away. I'm not his to give away, but he hardly cares about that, I'm sure. As long as he gets a big fat $70 million paycheck out of the whole affair, he'll be happy to do whatever is the Winsworths require of him. It's time, the brooding groomsman says. Let's go in. My father hooks one arm though mine, and then the chapel's front doors creak open. I get a glimpse of packed chapel pews on either side of the aisle, and then I freeze in place. Some stupid part of my stubborn brain is telling me that I can't go in yet I have to wait for Stephen to bring me my weapon, the vile love deadly neurotoxin. But then I feel someone shoving me from behind the groomsman, probably and my father pulling me along after him insistently, without so much as even turning to face me. He murmurs a few words to me in a low voice, out the corner of his mouth, so as not to draw my onlookers' attention as we walk down the aisle. Don't you dare fuck this up for me, he murmurs, and I feel my blood run cold at his callous materialism. My heart seems to ice over, frozen within my chest. It doesn't stay that way for long, though. The momentary coldness and despair in my heavy heart instantly begins to thaw the moment I see Oliver in a black tuxedo, waiting for me before the altar. Although his back is facing me, the sight of those broad shoulders and his dark tousled hair sends a familiar surge of excitement and anticipation through me six of the groomsmen are standing on one side of the altar, facing the seated congregation, while my six bridesmaids are on the other side each wearing the pale, dusty pink silk dresses I chose for them during the wedding aesthetic challenge. My mother, sitting in the front row alongside Cynthia and Franklin, is wearing a slightly gaudy lemon, yellow lace dress, and a ridiculous lime green fascinator, like some citrusy royal wedding-themed fancy dress costume. Cynthia, on the other hand, is the very picture of perfection, 
just as she always is, in a chic sage green, tailored mid-length dress, and crocodile skin stilettos. She and Franklin are beaming at me enthusiastically as I approach the front row, and to my surprise, I can see that my mom's actually wiping away tears as she stares adoringly up at me. Tears of joy, presumably. Joy over her imminent receipt of a whopping $70 million payoff. I finally reach the altar, standing beside Oliver. We both turn to face each other at the same moment, and my entire body stiffens in surprise and dread at what I see. Oh, no, Oliver's face says it all. He's trying hard to keep his composure, but I can immediately see that something is wrong, horribly wrong. Stephen, something must have happened to Stephen, which is why I was never given the promised via love neurotoxin, which means that our escape plan has pretty much gone to shit. Damn it. What the hell are we meant to do now? As if sensing my distress, Oliver takes my hand in his as we stand hand in hand, side by side, facing the priest. Now that I've got a moment to actually study the clergyman before me, I can see that he's no ordinary priest but rather some sort of Catholic cardinal, or maybe even someone higher up, based on how he's dressed. He's wearing long white and golden robes, along with a tall golden hat, like a bulbous crown. Does that funny crown hat thingy mean that he's a bishop or something? To my dismay, my passing thought triggers my smart lenses. I, a shimmering white line, visible only to me, shoots out from the crown with a label the pesky overlays, trying to be helpful again. The text reads, The mitre is a type of headgear known as the ceremonial headdress of bishops, and certain abbots in traditional Christianity, forming part of the pontifical vestments. Mitres are worn in the Anglican Communion, the Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, some Lutheran churches, and the Word. Not now. I dismiss the information, but as I do so, I allow a stray thought to slip in. So the guy's a bishop. I wonder if he's important. He looks like the Pope, Oh my God, is he the actual Pope? No sooner has this thought crossed my mind than another label appears in my line of sight, this time directly connected to the elderly man standing before Oliver and I, instead of his silly hat thing. The text scrolling across my retinas reads, Diomede Francesco Brugnaro, Secretary General of the Vatican City Governorate and Archbishop of the Catholic Church. Age, 78 years old. Nationality Italian. Height, 6 feet 2 inches. Weight, 194 lbs. Blood type, ab. Yikes, he may not be the Pope, but he's pretty high up. Is there anyone the Winds with family doesn't own? Lost in my thoughts, I barely take in the Archbishop's words as he drones on about love and marriage, the sealing of a sacred union, before God and so on and so forth. It's only when I hear my name spoken that I start paying attention again. Oliver and Valerie before the exchange of vows can take place, I must ask you three questions. The Archbishop says solemnly, Firstly, have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourself to each other in marriage, wholeheartedly and without coercion? I hesitate for a moment. I'm not sure if I want to laugh or to cry at this point, and every fiber in my body is screaming for me to shout. No. I mean, even though I now know that by some crazy miracle Oliver, and I truly do love each other, this is still a forced marriage at his parents, but he's... Yes. We moth murmur, while Oliver squeezes my hand reassuringly. Secondly, will you honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? The Archbishop continues. Yes. We both murmur, and this time, I really mean it. And third, will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and His Church? Again, it takes every ounce of self-control 
I possess not to burst out laughing at this one. I'm not religious or atheist exactly, more like undecided, but one thing I do know for sure is that I won't be forcing any religious beliefs or lack thereof on any children I have in the future. They'll be free to make up their own minds, if and whenever they choose. And that's assuming that Oliver and I even decide to have children in the first place. Yes. Oliver and I both murmur in unison. Excellent. The Archbishop says. Since it is your intention to enter into the covenant of holy matrimony, you may now join your right hands and declare your consent before the Lord. Oliver and I do as instructed. In the end, Cynthia decided that Oliver and I would recite traditional Catholic marriage vows, so luckily I didn't have to memorize anything, although I bet the overlays could have helped with that. Oliver, repeat after me. The Archbishop says, I, Oliver, take you, Valerie, to be me lawfully wedded wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. Oliver repeats the Archbishop's words, his bright green eyes, gazing into my own the entire time. Then it's my turn. I, Valerie, take you, Oliver, to be my lawfully wedded husband. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. I repeat the Archbishop's words, meaning every single one of them. Oliver is smiling now a genuine smile, and I smile back at him, momentarily forgetting where we are in the wolf's den, surrounded by a pack of ravenous wolves snapping at our heels. One wrong move, and who knows what'll happen to us. Then a boy in white robes and altar boy, I think steps forward, with two gleaming golden wedding rings, on a little red velvet pillow. He holds them up to the archbishop, who waves his hands over them in a complicated ritualistic motion, while intoning the words, May the Lord bless these rings, which you will give to each other as a sign of love and fidelity. Then he picks up the smaller of the two rings, and hands it to Oliver. Gazing into my eyes, Oliver slips the wedding band onto my ring finger, just above the detestable silver promise ring. Then the archbishop reaches for the larger wedding band and hands it to me with a nod. I slip it onto Oliver's finger, knowing in the deepest reaches of my heart that despite how we came to be here, this is right. Oliver and I belong together. Even if we were brought together by something so heinous, so evil, so wrong what we have is just so right. I love you, Oliver. I whisper to him on impulse, and his eyes glitter with emotion as he whispers back I love you too, Valerie. Ever since that damned elevator, my eyes are prickling over with tears as I stifle a giggle. Then I hear the archbishop announce, You are now lawfully wed in the eyes of God. Oliver, you may kiss the bride. And with that, Oliver's lips meet mine our union is sealed. Before we part, Oliver leans down and whispers into my ear, his voice low enough, so as not to be overheard by the archbishop. Later, we'll grab the knife at the cake-cutting ceremony, he murmurs. We turn around hand in hand to face the congregation, the crowd's deafening cheers washing over me, like a current of freezing cold water, sharpening my senses as I brace myself against what is to come. It's time to go all the way. As soon as I get my hands on that knife, I'm entering kill mode. The rest of the wedding passes by both excruciatingly slowly and surprisingly quickly. Oliver and I spent an hour earlier on the beach, taking photos with the wedding party, and our parents forcing smiles and playing the part of ecstatic, blissfully wedded bride and groom. Throughout the photo session, the bridesmaids and I shared several meaningful glances, unable to communicate openly, via words in front of Oliver's and my parents, but able to speak in other ways nonetheless. 
when any one of them shot me a questioning glance loaded with the obvious question of, is it still on? Are we still escaping? I'd nod subtly in response, hoping that they understood my meaning. After the photos, we were escorted to the reception location a massive white gazebo, set up in a clearing in the jungle, with numerous chairs and tables, and the dance floor set up beneath it. A DJ was already warming up the crowd and spinning out tunes when we arrived, and everything since then has been a sort of surreal blur. When we entered the gazebo with the wedding party, the DJ told the crowd to give a round of applause for the newlyweds, I present to you, the new Mr. and Mrs. Winsworth. I think it was hearing myself being referred to as the new Mrs. Winsworth that really did it. Only now is it really starting to sink in the enormity of what happened today. In the span of just a few hours, I've gone from being Valerie Green to Valerie Winsworth, wife of the heir of a major world-dominating tech conglomerate. And to think, this time last week I was single and marriage seemed like a vague, uncertain possibility far off on some distant horizon. After our arrival, Oliver and I performed our first dance at tango, and as promised, Oliver proved to be an excellent dancer. I surprised myself by getting absolutely every step right, and never once faltering, so I guess spending most of yesterday practicing the choreography over and over again paid all. Plus, the overlays provided a rolling list of instructions and diagrams to guide my every movement, so the whole thing went off without a hitch. Franklin gave another one of his long, boring, condescending speeches thanking everyone for attending and rambling on for ages about the strength and exciting future of the almighty Winsworth Interactive Company, and then we were served dinner. I'm sure the food was amazing, but I honestly barely even tasted it every last out of my attention for the past few hours has been fixed on one thing, and one thing only the massive seven-tiered wedding cake on a small round table in the corner of the gazebo. Which brings me to the present T-minus two minutes to action. It's time for the cake cutting ceremony, my dears. Cynthia tells Oliver and I with one of her sickly sweet as sugar smiles. She and Franklin are walking along with my parents over to the cake table, and then they stand on either side of it Franklin and Cynthia fanning out to the left and my parents to the right. My dad is more than a little tipsy, having gotten started on the whiskey hours ago. My mom miraculously still sober, despite the copious amount of champagne she must have consumed by now is coverly holding him up, having him lean against her, while he smiles blearily out at the watching crowd, swaying slightly on his feet. I can see how hard and fixed her fake smile is like me. She just wants this all to be over, but her reasons are quite different to mine. She just wants the wedding done and dusted ASAP, so that she and her snobbish husband Gareth can fly off on a private jet with seventy million dollars and wash their hands of me and my dad forever, leaving me to the wolves, while they live out the rest of their lives in blissful abandon. And my dad's not much better, he's just as cold-hearted as my mother, here for the money and nothing else. I'm sure that he's got a million plans for how he'll drink and gamble his way through the massive payload he's expecting out of this. Sorry, Mom. Sorry, Dad. I'm about to throw a major spanner into the works. Oliver and I walk hand in hand towards the cake table, where our parents watch us with a mixture of expectant delight and barely concealed impatience. As we reach the table, Oliver squeezes my hand gently in his, as if saying, It's time. I squeeze back, nodding my head. Then a groomsman brings us a long, gleaming silver cake knife. And not just any groomsman, it's the best man, Todd. Perfect. Todd hands me the knife with a smirk, his blue eyes gleaming with perversion as he sees. Careful you don't cut yourself, Mrs. Winsworth, it's sharp. In a mocking tone, 
he stands back to wait beside his masters, oblivious to the events about to unfold. I hold the cake knife in both hands over the bottom tier of the cake, feeling the weight of the cold metal handle beneath my grip. Can I really do this? Do I really have what it takes? Then I feel Oliver's hands wrap over mine, strengthening and reassuring and I know that I have what it takes and more. I have Oliver, and he has me. Together, we can do anything. Everything from this point feels as though it's happening in slow motion. In unison, our hands press down on the cake knife's handle, slicing through the vanilla buttercream icing and lemon raspberry white chocolate sponge. The overlays are counting down to touchdown, the string of numbers flashing rapidly across my vision three, two, one, go. The moment that the knife touches the bottom of the plate, Oliver and I yank it out of the cake. His hands release their hold over mine, and he steps back, elbowing his father in the face and sending him falling down to his knees in less than a second, his nose clearly broken by the impact. I whip around on my feet, and then I plunge the gleaming cake knife straight into Cynthia's still-beating heart. As I make my move, the overlays provide a holographic diagram overlay, showing the exact placement of her ribs and the precise angle and velocity at which to drive the knife in, and I hit my target with a sickening ease. Her bright green eyes widen in surprise as she purses her lips, gazing at me with a mix of confusion and awe, and then pure, unadulterated hatred. As the life leaves her eyes, she manages to gasp out one final sentence, her voice already weak and rasping. You ungrateful, little. But she never gets to complete her sentence. She falls down dead, the cake knife still embedded deep in her bloody chest. The entire room is silent for a matter of seconds, and then everything erupts into chaos. My parents look at me like I'm a complete stranger, and then both begin to retreat tumbling over themselves as they break into a run, fleeing from their maniac daughter without a second thought. There is screaming all around as Oliver swoops down in one fluid motion to pull the knife out from his mother's chest, immediately lodging it into the side of Todd's meaty neck, while the best man lunges at him. Oliver swiftly pulls the knife out of Todd's neck, sending a spray of bright red blood all over my crisp white dress and veil. Then he pirouettes on his heel, going after his father, who is on his knees, trying in vain to stop the flow of his gushing, bloody nose. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the bridesmaids spring into action. Assembled near the groomsmen on the far side of the gazebo, they launch themselves at the men, stabbing at them with butter knives and forks and anything else they can find. Todd is on the floor, desperately clawing at the gaping red hole in his neck as the pool of blood spreads out beneath him. He twitches, his hands clamped over his neck growing slack as blood pours out between the trembling fingers. Then he shudders and grows still, his eyes staring up blankly at the gazebo's white ceiling. Meanwhile, the overlays are showing me the flashing outline of the little silver remote, hidden away in a concealed pocket in Cynthia's dress. In a haze of bloodlust and adrenaline, I reach down and take the remote off her body, marveling at how the lenses immediately pull up instructions for operating the tech. There's a circular compression on the face of the gadget, like a flat spinning wheel embedded into the metal, with a small LCD screen at the center. The name Oliver is flashing on the screen. Following the overlay's instructions, I press down hard three times in quick succession, with my thumb on the southwest point of the metal ring circumference. The word released appears next to Oliver's name, and I watch as the little band of silver metal stacked, alongside his golden wedding band, clicks open like a handcuff, tumbling to the floor with a metallic chiming. I swipe my finger anti-clockwise along the remote's wheel, which pulls up my own name and once again, I click three times to release myself. 
I feel a light prickling sensation as the micro-needles, which have been embedded in my finger for the past week, are now withdrawn, and the uncomfortably tight promise ring clicks open, finally releasing me. While I scroll down the list of bridesmaids, releasing them from the promise rings in by one, Oliver is wrestling with his father for control over the final remote. Finally, he snatches the small metal object just as Franklin shoves him several feet backwards. Oliver hurls the remote far out of his father's reach, throwing it all the way to the other side of the cavernous gazebo, now all but empty as the shrieking, frenzied guests run from the venue in terror. His hands free now, Oliver's dad squirms on his side and reaches for something under his pants, leg just above his ankle. Oh no, an ankle holster. He pulls out a small black pistol, aiming it at Oliver. His finger squeezes down on the trigger, and then I spring into action, moving faster than I ever could have thought humanly possible. In the merest fraction of a second, the overlays plot a clear path of action for me. I lunge forward, closing the distance between Oliver and myself in less than a second. I grab for the flashing outline of the blood-smeared cake knife clutched in Oliver's hand, and he instinctively releases it at my touch. Then I aim it like an expert knife thrower, guided by the series of diagrams, arrows and instructions flashing rapidly across my retinas. I pull back and throw it, watching in a sort of cold, detached adrenaline-fueled disengagement, as the projectile perfectly follows the course calculated by the overlays hitting its target directly between the eyes and killing him instantly. Franklin Winsworth releases his hold on the pistol, allowing it to drop to the floor as he slumps back dead. The cake knife has pierced him straight through the frontal sinus at a sharp upward angle embedded deep in his brain. Valerie. I hear a Russian-accented woman screaming my name. Svetlana. Come on, let's go. She yells as the other bridesmaids pull Oliver and I away from the bloody massacre. We have to get to the boat shed. Oliver yells to the bridesmaids above the hub above the fleeing crowd, grabbing my hand in his own. Follow me. And then we run out the gazebo and into the jungle as fast as our feet will carry us. Oliver and I are sitting side by side in the golden late afternoon sun on our balcony, gazing out over Paris. The Eiffel Tower rises up in the near distance, shining in the gilded light as I take another sip of my lavender tea. As he so often does, Oliver reaches out and finds my hand, squeezing it gently in his own. It's incredible to think that almost nine months have passed since we fled that awful island along with the bridesmaids. Instead of escaping on jet skis as planned, we ended up taking a speedboat in the boat shed, reaching the larger island of Mauritius in under an hour. From there, Oliver arranged for us to be flown via helicopter and then private jet to a safe house in New York, where we worked with his lawyers on a plan of action. Shortly after this, we reported everything, and I mean everything, to the authorities. No charges were ever brought against us for the events on the island, as no one present at the wedding wanted to admit their involvement to authorities, and the evidence recorded by my smart lenses proved that we were acting in self-defense when we took the steps necessary to facilitate our escape. It was clear to the FBI that we were the victims, and the only perpetrators of any crime were Oliver's parents, plus the groomsmen, and the deceased Dr. Rumsuren. As for my parents, they never did end up getting the money, thanks to Franklin Winsworth's early demise, denying them of their promised payday. They came sniffing around Oliver, and I looking for a payout months ago, before we moved to France, and that was part of our decision to move overseas. For my own mental health, I cut off ties with them, and it's working out just fine. All the family I need is right here with me in this idyllic moment. And as for the groomsmen, 
several international law agencies spent the better part of January and February hunting them down one by one. By March, every last remaining groomsman had been rounded up and locked away except for Stephen, whose body was eventually found buried in the jungle outside the Winsworth's mansion, along with Donna's and Andreas. One of the groomsmen apprehended early on by the FBI admitted to having caught Stephen in the early hours of that morning shortly after he'd broken into the doctor's office to steal the syringes filled with neurotoxin. Apparently Stephen, loyal to the end, had refused to talk and never revealed that he was working for Oliver, even at the cost of his own life. That in particular is one of the main things that haunts both Oliver and I, and even after months of therapy and counseling, we still struggle with the weight of the deaths, oftos the Winsworths killed in their vile wedding games. Part of my healing process was making the decision a few months ago to permanently switch off the eye component of my smart lenses and the retinal overlays. It was the first thing I did after the FBI handed over possession of the iPad, controlling them to Oliver and I. I realized that as useful as they are, I don't need them anymore. Those were a handy tool for someone who needed to fight and to survive, but now I'm more focused on living a peaceful life with the man I love and building up our future together. As he'd always planned to, Oliver sold the WIC company to my old employer, White Star Gaming Studios, back in January. We decided to split the money from the sale six ways between myself and the five surviving bridesmaids it was important to us that other girls who went through hell with me could be compensated in some way for the horrors they endured. Plus, with Oliver's sizable trust fund and the money from his own personal business enterprises and investments, we have more than enough to live a very comfortable life in the City of Lights. After all, he was always a billionaire in his own right, even without his parents' blood money. Choosing Paris as our new home was a no-brainer. It was Paris that brought the two of us together on that first day we met in the elevator, and I dropped my portfolio at Oliver's feet, revealing the concept art for Ghosts of Paris. The cherry on top is that when Oliver sold the Winsworth Interactive Company to White Star, he did so on one condition, that they relinquish ownership of my game, and the immediate dismissal of Lucas Bateman, the head of game development who stole it. So now I have my game back, and after months of working with developers at an indie development company here in Paris, it's almost ready to its shelves. And just as that baby of mine goes out into the world, the timing will coincide perfectly with the birth of my other baby. Our baby, I should say. Ouch! That was a big one. I sigh feeling the baby kick inside of me. Oliver moves his hand to my swollen belly, his face lighting up with the blissful calm of a man who has been through hell and back, only to arrive finally at the promised land. We sit like that for ages, gazing out over the sparkling city of Paris spread out below us. A wonderful thought passes through my wandering mind, like a wisp of cloud, drifting on the afternoon breeze. In this crazy, wonderful, terrifying game called life, I have truly won the greatest prize of all. The game is over and I won. We won. Together.